Amen. So I'm going to preach a sermon this morning on the subject of bitterness entitled uh, Beware of Bitterness. You know, bitterness is something in our lives that we want to be on guard against. And we should never think that we've got to this place in our life where bitterness cannot yet creep in again in our lives and turn us into a bitter person and bring about, you know, all the fruit of bitterness. You know, we're going to talk about the fruit and the root of bitterness. You know, bitterness has a root that we have to keep in check. And if we leave it unchecked, it's going to bring certain fruits into our lives. It's going to manifest itself. And you're there in Hebrews chapter 12, um, bookmark uh, Hebrews chapter 12, but go over to Ephesians 4. We're going to look at Hebrews 12 and Ephesians 4 a couple times this morning, so you might want to just keep something in both passages. But, you know, what does it mean to be bitter? Basically, being bitter is to be in a state of discontentment. You know, when somebody's bitter, they're upset about, you know, the way things have gone for them. They're upset about maybe the condition that they're in, their circumstances. Maybe something has happened to them or somebody's done something to them, said something to them, and they hang on to that and they become discontent about the, you know, how things have turned out in their life. And I'm, I'm speaking generally. But, you know, that's what bitterness is. It's basically just, if you boil it down to, uh, what it is, is a state of discontentment. You're unsatisfied, you're unhappy with the way things are, and instead of just being at peace with it or letting it go, you hang on to that, you harbor resentment, and then you become uh, a bitter person. It's a state of discontentment. And I don't want to uh, you know, get the, give everyone this idea that all bitterness is, is evil, you know, or <clears throat> that it's something that's bad. Like if we find somebody who's in anguish or somebody who's uh, going through a hard time, and maybe they have a little bit of a, a, of a, a cloud hanging over their head that would say, oh, they're just a bitter person. You know, being bitter about things sometimes actually is a natural reaction. I'll just read to you a couple passages. It says in Job 7, I mean, if anybody had an excuse to be bitter about things, it was Job. I mean, we see people get bitter in our lives over the dumbest things, and they, and they hang on to resentment and things, and they and, and destroy relationships in their lives for, for over the, some of the smallest things, Right? I mean, Job, he's losing his kids, he's lost his wealth, he's lost his, his physical health. All these things are taken away from him. So can you really blame him where he says in, in chapter 7, verse, seven uh, verse 11, Therefore I will not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. I mean, I'm not going to be one to, I wouldn't want to walk up to, to Job and just say, well, you need to just let it go, Job. You know, you need to just get over it. You know, he went through a lot. And if and, and some, you know, that's a good lesson too. It's kind of a sub point, but whenever somebody's going through something hard in their life, like really hard, if they are, if they're complaining in the anguish of their spirit, you know, we should just give that person grace. Even if, if you'd say, well, you know, it's not right, maybe they should just, just kind of move on. Or maybe they maybe they're a little bit, you know, harsh. Maybe they say something to us, maybe they lash out in anger, you know, because they're going through some difficult trial in their life. You know, we don't have to, you know, expect them to behave perfectly in every uh, instance, if they're going through, you know, anguish of spirit, kind of like what Job was going through here. Now, of course, everything Job said was right. And, uh, you know, we'll see later that Job wasn't somebody who held on to bitterness, that he let it go. But you could also think about Hannah in First Samuel chapter uh, one, you know, she was one that was barren and wanted a child. And when she, uh, it says that she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Okay. So it's a natural reaction for people sometimes to be bitter, you know, but Really, with the, what I want to focus in on more this morning is the fact that some people, you know, they hang on to things, and it makes them a bitter person. They hang on to things that they probably shouldn't hang on to. They, they want to justify that they're bitter. They want to justify that they're angry about some circumstance or situation in their life. And really, they, they really don't have any justification for it at all. You know, and, and to kind of give us an idea, what does it mean to be, have a bitter spirit or a bitter attitude? Well, just think about, you know, when you bite into something bitter. You know, if you suck on a, a lemon that's very bitter... You know, you hold that in your mouth, you know, you make a face, right? You start to get that lemon face. And sometimes we'll even say that about people. If they're in a bad mood, they're like, what, do you have lemons for breakfast? You know, like, you know, you'll say something like that to that effect because they're making a bitter almost face, right? And that's kind of the same thing we can do spiritually. You know, we can do that in our own lives, you know, with our, uh, uh, the way we behave ourselves and conduct ourselves. You know, sometimes people have something, you know, as the saying goes, life gives them lemons, right? And instead of just you know, making lemonade, they take a big old bite out of lemon, and they just walk around the rest of their life just, just bitter about what happened, just about the lemon that they got in life, right? And so you can kind of see how that's a, a, an illustration to kind of give us an idea about what it means to be bitter, okay? And this is the fruit of bitterness. If you're there in, uh, in are you in Ephesians? Have you go there, Ephesians chapter 4? It says in verse 31, let all bitterness. Now notice that bitterness is what leads this list, Bitterness is, you know, this is what's the, the, the root of bitterness is what we're going to talk about. 
so you have the root here in, in verse 31, and then you have the fruit that it brings. You know, I believe that you, obviously you could have any one of these things without the other, right? But I believe that if you have bitterness in your life and in your heart, if you harbor these feelings, these other things are going to come, uh, this is the fruit that bitterness is going to bear in your life. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So you can kind of see how in this list, bitterness is kind of the root here, and what follows is the fruit of bitterness. You know, you have wrath, which comes from it. You know, what, what is wrath? Anger in action is basically what wrath is. You know, some people are, are angry, right? But they, but they learn to control that anger. They learn to keep that in. They don't lash out, right? Or maybe they even deal with it and get over it. Whereas with wrath, it's, it's kind of like anger in action. You know, you think about when God, at the, at, you know, in Revelation, what does he do? He pours out his wrath. God's been angry with the wicked every day. And then when it comes time to judge, he pours out his wrath, right? So it's, it's his anger in action. And if we harbor bitterness in our life, you know, our, our anger is going to manifest itself in the form of wrath. You know, we're going to start to be, you know, do things to people, say things to people, hurt other people. Uh, you know, then you have anger, you know, which, which you know, kind of is the uh, same thing as wrath. But again, it's more of a passive, right? This is where you get the passive aggressive stuff. This is where it's maybe they're not going to just lash out, but they're going to harbor. They're going to hold on to some kind of anger or resentment. Think about clamor, right? This is another fruit of bitterness. We're talking about the, you know, the root and the fruit of bitterness. So you have bitterness as this root in your life that can bring these other things, and you end up having wrath, anger, and what else? Clamor. You know, and clamor is not a real common word that we use, but it's basically, you know, a loud and persistent cry. You know, people who get bitter about things in life, they want everybody to know about it. They're persistent and they're loud about it. You know, you always have that, that relative at the at the family Christmas, whoever wants to pull you aside and just remind you of everything that so-and-so did to them, or some sibling wants to remind some other sibling everything they said to them once or what they did to them. Some, you know, friends do this, if they're even friends anymore. This is the, you know, they want to they make sure everybody knows about it. Not, they're not just bitter and angry. They also want to be clamorous about it. They want to make sure that they're loud and they're persistent. They're not going to let it go. I mean, think about, you know, where we see this. This is like a, something you see a lot on Facebook and social media, right? where people get upset about something and then it just turns into this flame war online and people are just going back and forth. And, and really this is the fruit of bitterness in your life, not being able to let things go, holding on to things, keeping them in, letting them make you sour. You know, this is what it's going to bring in your life. Wrath, anger, clamor. What else? Evil speaking, like evil speaking. You know, clamor is where you're kind of just letting everybody know. You're just kind of spouting it out. You're loud, you're insistent. You're persisting in just letting everybody and anybody who wants to hear about how bitter you are about something, let them know. Whereas evil speaking, you know, I think of that more like that would be something you might do more privately, something you might take somebody aside and kind of then whisper in their ear and talk about whoever it is you're bitter with or whatever you're bitter about. Instead of just spouting it out and, you know, for all the world to see, you're going to do it in a, in, a, in a more subtle way. This is evil speaking where you're going to, you know, talk trash on somebody, but you're going to do it more privately. But it's all coming from the same place. It's all coming from the fact that, you know, we're harboring bitterness in our hearts. And then you have, you know, malice there at the end, which is a really severe word. I mean, this is about, you know, think of, you know, maliciousness, malice, right? This is where your, your words and actions, you know, are, are proactively seeking to harm somebody else. That's how you, you know, this is where bitterness leads in our life. This is why it's an important topic. And this is why we should pay attention to what's being preached. Because if we harbor bitterness in our lives, you know, maybe we could put up with the anger and the wrath and the clamor and the evil speaking, you know, and think, well, that's not that big a deal. You know, everybody does it. But the malice, you know, that, that's where this could lead potentially, where you're actually proactively seeking the harm of another person, either through your words or through your actions. You know, you're trying to get revenge. You want to make them feel just as bitter about things as you are. And you're going to do whatever it takes to make sure that they feel that way. And Paul is telling us here that we need to put these things away from us, you know. So if we got saved and then just there was just no potential for us to ever become bitter again, then what sense is this passage? Why does Paul have to tell Christians, born-again Christians in Ephesus, to put away these things? Because if we're not careful, you know, bitterness can creep back into our lives. It can be something that can come into our hearts because we all still have the flesh, we're all going to have to, you know, mingle with other people. We're all going to have relationships in our lives. Those are all opportunities. Those are all, you know, potential uh, opportunities for, you know, bitterness to come into our lives and to manifest these fruits in our lives. So that's kind of the, the fruit there. But let's, 
you know, we saw the root there of, of, of what it brings, or the fruit rather, but he said to let it put away. You know, bitter people in the Bible didn't stay bitter. You know, Hannah, her prayer was answered, and it wasn't like she held on to that bitterness. Well, it would have been nice to have this baby sooner, Lord. You know, she got over that. Like, she didn't hang on to that, right? Job, we know his latter end was blessed. And it's not, the Bible doesn't record him going through the rest of his life just, you know, hanging on to the fact that his original 10 children died. Or all that wealth he used to have. You know, people need to learn to let bitterness go. Let it go, okay? Put it away from you. It's a, there's a, there's a, a purple, uh, purposefulness right there, right? It's a, it, there's an intent behind that. When he's telling us to let go, when he's telling us to put it away, right? You have to be proactive in this. This isn't something you can just, God's just going to come in and cut bitterness out of your life and it's just going to magically, you know, go away. You have to identify the fact and admit the fact that you might have bitterness in your heart. And if that's the case, then you have to be proactive about putting it away from you. You know, and there's ways that we do that. We'll talk about that in a minute. You know, bitter people in the Bible, they didn't stay that way. How do they put away bitterness from them? Well, they took their complaint to the Lord, right? Hannah, she was bitter, but what did she do? Did she go on Facebook and just complain about her circumstance, complain how it wasn't fair, how, you know, her, you know, uh, her, you know her, uh, her husband's other wife is having kids and she's not. Everybody else has this great big family and she doesn't. Is she bitter about that? Was, was Job complaining about how, you know, he lost his job? you know, or, or he, you know, a lot of other worse things, you know. No, he took their complaint to the only person who can do anything about it, which is God. You know, that's the thing about, you know, being clamorous about your bitterness and, and being in the evil speaking and letting people know and complaining about it is that the people around us very rarely can do anything about it to help you. You know, and bitter people, they're not looking for help. They just want other people to feel bitter like them. Okay? Now, I'm not saying we can't go look for sympathy and we shouldn't be, lend a, a sympathetic ear and comfort you know, other people and things like that. I understand that. But sometimes that's not what people are looking for. They just want you to know how mad they are, how angry are, they are, how upset they are, and that there's nothing you can do to help them. And they're just, that's the way there's always going to be. You know, and that is the way they're always going to be unless they learn to do like Hannah did and like Job did and actually go to the Lord for help, actually seek Him, because He's the only one that can do anything about it. You got to take your complaint to the Lord. Are you? I should add you go to Hebrews chapter 12. If you're already bookmarked there, Hebrews chapter number 12. That's where we started this morning. So we need to beware of bitterness in our lives because of the fruit that it'll bring. And if we're going to beware of bitterness, then you need to understand that there's always the potential of bitterness in your life because the root of bitterness is always there. It's always there. Okay. And if you look at Hebrews chapter 12, you kind of get this picture. It says in verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. So he's warning us there that lest there be any root of bitterness springing up that troubles us. You know, and that tells me, you know, and this is, believe, this is talking more about uh, the congregation at large. You know, unless there's some bitter individual like an Esau who springs up among us and defiles many. But, you know, we could apply this even to our own lives, you know, personally, you know, our, our own uh, inward lives. You know, there's always underneath the surface this root of bitterness that's always there. I believe that, that it's not something that's just been cut out and permanently removed. It's something that is always present. We might not be a bitter person. You know, we might not have these fruits manifesting in our lives. You know, the root of bitterness might not be flourishing. It might not have, you know, germinated and taken root and taken off. And now we've got this giant stock of bitterness in our life with all these big, heavy branches just weighing down. But, you know, the root is always there. I believe that because of the fact that we always have the old man. We always have the old man. Go to Hebrew. You're in Hebrews 12. Keep something there, but go over to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. You always have the old man present with you. So the present, the, or excuse me, the potential for bitterness, bitterness is always present as a root because of the fact that we always have the flesh to deal with. And we always have these relationships in our lives where things can go wrong, things can go bad. Uh, circumstances or situations in life can cause us to become bitter about things. In Galatians chapter 5, he says in verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, 
witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, and what else? Envyings. Say, what is the root of bitterness? Well, I believe it all comes from envy. A lot of it has to come from envy. I think envy is, when, you know, when I was thinking about this, envy is a source of bitterness for people. I think it's a big root of bitterness for people. People look at, you know, the success of others, what others are doing, what others have, and they begin to envy that. And because they don't have that, they, they become bitter. Instead of just be happy for that person, instead of just congratulating them or encouraging them or thanking God for them, you know, what do they do? They become envious. And what that actually brings in their life is bitterness because envy is the root of bitterness. <clears throat> uh, if you want to, go over to, um, we'll go back to Hebrews chapter 12. The Bible says, a sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, right? So there's that analogy of, you know, how our heart, you know, it pumps, it issues, it, it, it pumps blood throughout our body, right? But it's also, it's this organ that we have inwardly. It's something that's within us, right? And it says that envy is the rottenness of bones. So envy is kind of like our heart. It's something that's within us, right? And it affects the whole person, it affects the whole body. Just like your heart, you know, a sound heart is going to keep you alive, you know, it's going to keep your extremities fed with blood. It's going to keep oxygen coursing, uh, you know, through your, your, your circulatory system. It's going to keep you alive, right? It's something that's within and is the life of the flesh. Well, he likens bitter envy unto this because it's something that is within us and affects the whole thing and affects us on a very deep level, right? It's the rottenness of the bones, right? Now, if, you know, bone cancer and things like that, that's a very severe form of, of cancer, isn't it? You know, skin cancer, as bad as that is, is still something that if it's caught early, can usually just be removed with a scalpel, some healing, you know, takes place. But a lot of times when people have gotten bone cancer, it's been there under the radar for so long, by the time it's di diagnosed, it's too late to do anything about it. So you think about how envy, you know, affects the bones. It's like this cancer that's just deep within us, and it's just there under the surface. And, if, and unless, you know, we diagnose it and do something about it, it's, it can affect the whole body. And you think about, you know, the importance of the bones. It's what's holding up our structure. It's who we are. If those go bad, you know, if we break a leg or, or something like that, you know, we're hobbled. You know, we are handicapped. And this is what envy will do in our life because it is the root of bitterness. You know, envy and bitterness, it creeps in. It rots the bones. It makes us unstable. It affects our whole being. And in fact, it can destroy us. We can end up spending our whole lives just being bitter at people, angry at people, and just never you know, uh, doing anything but what? Fulfilling this lust of the flesh. You know, the works of the flesh are manifest. And it says that the work of the flesh is envy. You know, it's our natural state to want to be envious of people. You know, it's our natural state that the fallen man wants to, you know, is prone to being bitter, being, uh, being angry and upset about things. So there's always this root that's present. There's always a root of bitterness that's just under the surface because we always have the flesh we always have the old man, and that's why we have to beware of bitterness. Be ready to cut it out and identify it. And here's the thing, you know, some people, you know, a lot of people in this room, probably everybody, I'm just going to assume everybody in here is not a, a bitter person, right? And I mean, if you ask me who in here is bitter, I wouldn't know who to point you to, okay? But here's the thing, we probably have all known bitter people, you know, and, and I know this, that there are people who, they're not only bitter, but they actually nurture bit bitterness in their life. Because again, it's the work of the flesh, right? The natural man, you know, what are the other works besides envying that are listed there? You have adultery, fornication, uncleanness. Those are things that people want to do because there is the pleasure of sin for a season, right? You know, the fornicator, the adulterer, you know, they don't just do that, you know, that sin because, you know, they, they just, they're, they're, they, they're uh, you know, they can't help themselves. They want to do those things, you know, and these other works of the flesh are the same way. You know, envying is the same way. Being bitter, like we like to be bitter sometimes, don't we? We like to like, you know, pick people apart and, 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 and have a reason to be upset at somebody. You know, you know, a real just base level, you know, minor example of this would be, you know, traffic, right? This, you know, I'm just confess my faults, all right? Somebody, you know, you could tell they want to come over, but they haven't used their blinker, and then they just cut you off, and then it's like, then you just spend the next 10 miles behind them just bitter, right? And, you, and it's like, you know that, You've probably done that to other people. You know, you've probably been guilty of that. And it's just, hey, everyone's going to make mistakes on the road, and we're all just trying to stay alive. But part of us kind of likes it. it. helps pass the time. helps the miles go by. 
right? <clears throat> Makes us feel alive, get the blood pumping, you know, we're just thinking, you know, how I'd like to just pull alongside them and, you know, knock them off the road and, you know, and give them a piece of my mind and all this, right? But that not that kind of what our flesh is prone to do, that it kind of likes, it enjoys this envy, this bitterness, this wrath, this mouse. That's what the works of the flesh are. That's what the flesh wants to do. And here's the thing. Some people, they're going to nurture bitterness in their life. It's, they're, they're, they're not only going to admit, yeah, I'm bitter, you know, I'm angry, I'm upset, I'm holding on to things. They're actually going to take the time to nurture that bitterness in their life. I always, you know, I've thought about this, and I, I think I've used this el- illustration in the past. I don't know if anyone remembers, but, you know, people, you know, if, if bitterness is being likened unto the root of bitterness, it's like a plant, right? And, and it, we have to make sure that it doesn't spring up. We have to keep that thing, you know, uh, trimmed. we gotta, we got to prune bitterness in our life. Some people, they're going to water that root. They, 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 they will, they'll have, you know, they'll have you over for dinner, you know, they'll have you over uh, as a guest in their house, and then you'll go out and admire their garden, and they'll show you their, you know, award-winning roses, and their tulips, and their, you know, they got all these cool plants everywhere, and then they're going to take you around the corner to their, their most beloved possession, their, their, their root of bitterness, and how it's just lush, and it's full, and it's just grown. And, and what are they doing? You know, they're, they're bringing you over and letting you know how upset they are with this person or this situation. What are they doing? They're trying to take a clipping off that plant and like, here, you go, you go home and plant some bitterness in your life. Maybe you could have a nice, big, you know, fruitful plant of bitterness like I have, right? That's what some people do in their lives. They water bitterness, they cultivate it, they fertilize it, and they show it off to other people. And in fact, they try to spread it around. Say, here, here's some seeds. Go home and plant your own. You know, take this cutting and put in a little pot of water or a pot of dirt, and you can have your own bitterness. They like to spread it around. It's like a vine. So that's why, you know, he's liking this bitterness unto a root. Why? Because it's always there. And if we're not careful, if we're not, if we do not uh, take, you know, caught, if we're not, if we are not, uh, you know, uh, beware, if we do not beware of bitterness, I'm trying to say that in a way that makes sense grammatically. If we're not careful about it, you know, it could spring up in our lives too. It's something we have to keep in check. Why? Because it's a work of the flesh. It's always there. A lot of times it starts with envy. <clears throat> you know, and this, this is something that, that people want to spread around. How do they do this? Uh, you know, through slandering, like the evil speaking, right, that we talked about earlier. Whosoever privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart will I not suffer. You know, some people want to privately slander their neighbor to you. And what they're, where that's really coming from you ever had anybody do that to you? I mean, I, I've had people come aside and say, hey, what do you want, want to talk smack about so-and-so? You know, talk trash about so-and-so. Where is that coming from? That's coming from envy. That's coming from bitterness. It's not just because, well, I don't have anything else to talk about. You know, they just can't. You know, it's just, that's what they want to talk about. They want to privily slander their neighbor. They want to, you know, spread that root of bitterness around in your life as well. So how do you handle that? You know, and this is just kind of a side topic. How do you handle the fact that when somebody comes to you and wants to talk smack about somebody? Well, the Bible says in Proverbs 25, and this is a great verse to to keep in mind. In verse 23, it says, The north wind driveth away rain. The north wind driveth away rain. Now, we know something about this down here in Tucson, right? We always see those storms come out of the south, right? Come out of Mexico, and we watch those clouds during the monsoon season, and we think, is it going to make it here? Is it going to get all the way up here? Are we going to get some rain, right? And then the north wind comes in and just drives it all the way. We're like, no, come back, right? That's why I moved to the south side of town, so I can get some of that, right? <clears throat> but that's kind of what the north wind does. It drives away the rain, right? It makes that storm go away. It lets the sun come back out, right? That's the analogy that he's using here. He says, the north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. So just like that north wind comes in and blows that rain out, it says that an angry countenance comes in and what? Blows away a backbiting tongue. You know, when someone comes to you and wants to privately slander their neighbor just because they're envious, they're bitter, you know what? It's an angry countenance that's going to make them go away. And I've known people that have taken note of this verse and used exactly this. You know, where someone comes and wants to talk trash about somebody and you just get that look like, well, I don't want to talk trash. You know, that person's my friend. You know, I don't appreciate you talking about that. In fact, let's go talk to them. Oh, no, no, never mind. And then then they instantly know, well, don't ever try to backbite with this guy because he just gets mad. What's it doing? Driving away that that rain. That's the north wind, that angry countenance. You know, sometimes it's okay to put on your your mad face. You know, get a little angry if somebody's trying to backbite or privately slander 
your neighbor to you. Because all they're trying to do, it's not, you know, it's not that they're trying to warn you about some bad person or something like that. They're trying to, they're trying to give you their little cutting of bitterness for you to go home and think about, well, was so-and-so really like that? You know, so and so, you know, and, and get you bitter about that person too. So that's a good, uh, ap, you know, application, right, of the sermon. But we have to we have to learn to prune this, you know, uh, this root in our life because this root will will spring up if we don't keep it in check, you know. And this could happen. It could happen in any any setting, you know, any relationship in our life. I mean, you think about uh, all the different relationships that you know we all have you know, to some degree or another, you know, you could think about, you know, between a husband and wife, spouses, right? Is it possible that a hum- husband and wife could get bitter at each other about something? I mean, if there's any relationship where bitterness has the potential to spring up between two people, it's marriage. Because, you know, people are, you know, uh, are different. They have different ideas. They come into marriage with, uh, you know, uh, different habits, different things that they do. And people can, you know, in marriage, you know, uh, get bitter at one another just because they're, you know, they don't get along. They have some disagreement instead of just, you know, submitting or, you know, um, admitting that you were wrong or changing. You just hang on. Right. And it just turns into this, you know, the standoff in your marriage. And what's going to happen is bitterness is going to is going to creep in. It's going to take root and then it's going to bear fruit in that marriage, in that relationship. Because there's one relationship that we need to really make sure we're not getting bitter against our spouses over something. Even if they, what they did was wrong. And you say, well, you know, she, what she did was wrong. What he did was wrong. You know what? You might be right. You know, maybe they were wrong. Maybe, that, maybe the, the decision your husband made was wrong. But, you know, that's not a reason for you to sit there and harbor resentment in your heart against him. You know, we need to learn to forgive. You know, we need to, like Christ loved us, right? We need to learn to forgive and to forget and not hold on to bitterness in our lives because it's going to bear fruit that we don't want anything to do with. You know, it's going to turn into maliciousness. It's going to turn into clamor and evil speaking. We don't want these things in our lives. So that's one relationship. You can think about, you know, uh, children and parents. You know, again, you know, parents are going to make mistakes. Parents aren't perfect. Newsflash, they're human too. You know, it's real easy for the kids to get mad at the parents over something they perceive as wrong, and maybe they were even they even were wrong. But, you know, you haven't even begun to walk a mile in your parents' shoes. So you better think about that before you get angry and resentful and bitter against them. You know, and it's amazing to me, and the longer I'm a parent, how many times I'm noticing, like, well, when I was a kid, you know, I'm doing what I was mad at my mother about and my father about. So, well, I mean, you've all, kids have probably said this, most kids, you know, well, when I'm a parent, I'm never going to. Right, your parent does something to you, or tells you, or punishes you, or tells you to do something. Well, when I'm a kid, I, where I'm a parent, I'm never gonna have my kids take out the trash. I'm never gonna give them a list of chores. It's like, yeah, right. That's like half the reason for having kids. No, I'm just gonna <laughs> get these slaves. Oh, did I say that? <laughs> but isn't that true? Though? Isn't it? Isn't it true that kids can look at their parents and get bitter at them, and angry and resentful? you know, over the thing, the decisions that they may make, right or wrong, you know, that should not be the case because you know, if you're looking for an opportunity to get bitter at people in your life, they, they abound. I don't care what relationship it is. You know, you go to work, you want to get bitter out of your boss over some, some uh, decision he makes, you know, you can do that because you know what? Your boss isn't perfect either. He's going to make mistakes. He's going to do something wrong. And you can go ahead and get bitter about it and hang on to it and be resentful and, and, and so on and so forth, and let bitterness just bear all this fruit in your life. In any relationship, you know, that could happen in a church. You know, the preacher gets up and rips face, you know, steps on your toes, preaches on your sin, you know, and, and by the way, you stick around long enough, if the preacher's doing his job, he's going to step on your toes eventually. You know, if he preaches the whole counsel of God, you know, because nobody's perfect. Again, it all comes back to that, doesn't it? Nobody's perfect, and the preacher gets up, and he's doing his job, and he preaches the whole counsel of God, eventually he's going to get on your sin. Eventually, he's going to step on your toes. And then you have a decision to make. You say, well, am I, am I going to get bitter about that? Am I going to be angry and resentful? You know, and, and this can happen in any relationship. And a lot of times, people, you know, maybe it just turns into like a, a, a you know, a, a, a simmering, a, you know, a resentment. It's just kind of under the surface. You know, people can put on the smile and they can be nice and they can play nice. For, but under the surface, there's this, there's this root of bitterness that's just, it's just festering. It's growing. And if we're not careful, if we don't check that, eventually it will blossom. It will all come forth and it'll bear these fruits in our lives, no matter what relationship it is. So we have to learn to prune this root of bitterness, right? We need to beware of bitterness and understand that it's a root, that it's there, and it's something that has to be uprooted 
and replaced, okay? And again, it's always there. It's always potential that it's gonna germinate here, it's gonna germinate there, it's gonna spring up here. And when we see that happening, you know, we gotta get out the spiritual shovel and dig that thing out and just be looking at the, the garden of our life, you know, the lawn of our life and just be looking for these weeds, these roots of bitterness that wanna spring up, you know, and, and just take over in our lives. Did I, where did I have you go? Did I have you go anywhere? You're in Hebrews chapter 12, right? Go over to, uh, well, just stay there. The Bible says in, in, in Psalms chapter 34, what man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? <clears throat> Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good and seek peace and pursue it. You know, again, if we're supposed to put, you know, uh, bitterness away from us, if we're supposed to put these things away, you know, that's kind of the, 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 the trimming of, of the bitterness, right? Getting rid of that. But there's other things that we need to learn to cultivate in our lives. There's other things that we have to replace that with. We don't want to just have this, this barren, you know, uh, garden in our life. You know, we want to get the, yeah, we want to get the weeds of bitterness out, but we want to plant other things there. We want other things to take root. There are things that we do want to grow. There are things that we do want to, you know, blossom in our lives. But those are things, and those are things that we have to, what, pursue, Right? That's what he said there. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. So it's not just this you know, passiveness in the Christian life where we just depart from evil and that's it. There's a departure and then there's a pursuit. You, know, you have to leave one and pursue the other. Depart from the evil and pursue the good. Seek the peace. And we should be people that seek peace in our life. You know, in, all, in all of our relationships. Now I understand you know, it's not peace at all costs. Sometimes we have to draw a line in the sand and, and call a spade a spade and, and pick sides and so on and so forth. I get that. That has to happen. But, you know, I wonder how, how many times, you know, we think that's the case when it's really not. When it's really just we, we're going to be bitter and angry and resentful because we want to be. We could pursue peace. We could seek peace with all men, but we're not going to do it because we prefer to be bitter. Are you in Hebrews 12? Verse 14, it says, follow peace with all men. You know, it's something that has to be pursued. It's something that has to be followed. You know, and peace is kind of the, the opposite of bitterness. It's the opposite of resentment. It's the opposite of malice, right? That was that root of bitterness in Ephesians 4 was, that was the, the, you know, bitterness was what began it all, and it ended with malice. And there's all these other things in between. You know, maliciousness and being malice is, you know, seeking the harm of somebody else. You know, peace would be the opposite of that. And that is something we should follow in our life. We should follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. We need to follow peace. So we need to follow after these things which make for peace and which things wherewith we may edify one another, it says in Romans chapter 14. Uh, if you want to go over to uh, Ephesians 4 again, we're going to end there. But the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, flee also youthful lusts, but righteousness, but excuse me, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Look, there's some things we should follow after. There are some things we should pursue. There are some things that we do want to cultivate in our lives. Peace, righteousness, faith, charity with them that call the, poor, the Lord of, with, a, with a pure heart. You know, we want to be at peace with people as much as we can. And we don't want to harbor resentment and anger. Look, if somebody does you wrong, it's best to just let it go. If somebody, you know, harms you in your life, it's best to just let it go. Instead of, you know, forgiving them, you know, well, well they didn't ask for forgiveness. Forgive them anyway. Forgive them anyway. And don't let, you know, bitterness take root in your life. You know, peace is something that has to be pursued. Peace is something that has to be followed. And you're there in Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse 1. You know, and I, I, every time, I feel like I'm, I'm preaching this verse a lot lately. In this last year, I feel like this is a verse I keep going back to. And I don't like sounding like a broken record. But if there's anything this last year has taught us in this country and in this world and in, even in our church is that, you know, peace is something that has to be pursued. And if we're going to do that, we cannot get bitter at people. We cannot hang on to resentment. It says in verse 1, I therefore, the, uh, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So the bond of peace, the unity of the Spirit, is something that has to be endeavored to keep. It's not going to keep itself. It's not just going to happen on its own. You know, we, it's something that has to be endeavored to be kept. You know, getting the root of bitterness in your life, you know, you can't, 
just call the, you know, the, the, you can't just hire the gardener to come in and spray the weeds. Everyone's like, you got it out and put the gloves on and get the little rake out and, and go at it. You know, maybe we got to get the chainsaw out. You know, maybe in our life, bitterness has just taken off so far. It's gotten so far gone. You know, we actually have to cut a tree down, so to speak. We got to get a chainsaw out. We got to, we got to limb it up, get a bucket in there and haul it off and burn it. And then we got to work on the stump, get a pickaxe that maybe some dynamite and blow that thing up. You know, we got to work on this, you know, this, cause that's where it leads. It's better to get out there and, and, and weed the garden when they're this big, where you can just bend over and kind of pick them out. Right? Like when I moved into the, our house here, you know, out in the front yard, underneath the tree, we had these little other little stickers coming up. They're about that big. And I thought to myself, I got to take care of that. You know, I don't want to be that guy in the block where he just lets everything go. You know, I want to be the guy that has a nice lawn. You know, I'm not saying it has to be some immaculate ornate thing, but I'm not going to be people drive by and go, wow, he's really letting the place go. They're about this tall now, <laughs> right? I'm thinking I got to get some pruning shears. I got to get out there. And eventually, if I'm not careful, you know, I'm going to have to get a pickaxe out and then I'm going to have to really go to work. And then, you know, but that I'm using as an illustration, you know, that's the way it is with bitterness in our life. If we want to be at peace with one another, if we don't want to be bitter towards other people, it's something that has to be endeavored to keep. It's something that we have to pursue. And a big part of that is making sure that the bitterness isn't there to begin with. And again, this is an ideal, right? Endeavoring to keep the unity in the, in the, in the, in the, in, of the spirit and the bond of peace. It's something that is an ideal. You remember, we think of Psalms 133, right? Behold how good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. You know, and, and, and it seems to me like, that's kind of a special thing. You know, brethren aren't always going to dwell together in unity. Not everybody's going to get along. Sometimes there's going to be divisions and factions and splinterings and, and, and things like that. And I get that to some degree. But within the local church, you know, within this church, within our personal relationships, you know, unless there's a real clear-cut reason why we need to just cut people out of our lives or separate, you know, we should endeavor to keep the, the you know, the, uh, the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. It's something that's to be pursued. And it's an ideal. Ideally, you know, all brethren would dwell together in unity, but that's just, that's an ideal. That's why it says how good and how pleasant. How good is it? You know, and it tells me that's not something that happens all the time. You know, bitterness is something that we need to cut out of our life. You know, bitterness and bitter people are basically dead weight. You know, things that are going to weigh us down, the things that are going to keep us from doing the things we ought to do. Because again, you know, it's, it's, it's talking about pursuing these things, right? To follow after, to endeavor to keep these things. These are things that have to be followed, pursued. You know, there's a, there's a, we're always trying to keep up with that. We're always trying to move forward in these areas. And if we have bitterness in our lives, if we have bitter people in our lives, those things are dead weight. They're going to hold us back, you know, and we want to pursue these things. We want to have peace. That's the ideal. That's what we're striving for. It's what we're endeavoring for. You know, and if everybody does kind of a self-check, if everybody in the, in the church, if, you know, if both partners in the marriage, if everybody in the family, if everybody at the company, if every person took responsibility for themselves and their own heart and just made sure that there was no root of bitterness springing up, then we could have that pleasant, you know, uh, unity. You know, we could, then we could say, behold, how good it is when we dwell together in unity. But that's something that we all as individuals have to pursue. You know, and, and cutting out, you know, this root of bitterness in our life is going to help us do that. Let's go ahead and pray.